O oh, beautiful for spacious skies or amber waves of grain. With pesticides over fertilized, transported clear from Spain. Sometimes food may not be as wholesome as it looks. Your tasty sandwich may come with a lot of byproducts. Many current agricultural practices are unsustainable in the long run and dependent on chemicals that are hard on our bodies and the land. But hey, a guy's got to eat. We sure do. That's why we want to talk about eating local, enjoying food that's Puget Sound fresh. Hi, I'm Greg Rayburn. And I'm Doug Rice. Welcome to Yard Talk. We're here at Patty and Howard Stambor's home in Magnolia. Soon you'll see why this is a great place to talk about eating local food. We are what we eat, and right now that might involve a whole lot of high fructose corn syrup and processed foods shipped from all over the world. And that's not the half of it. Industrial agriculture relies on pesticides and unhealthy fertilizers. These chemicals can run off into our streams and lakes. I've suddenly lost my appetite and that sandwich was looking pretty good. Okay, how about this? Let's see how we can make a great sandwich from ingredients that come from the Puget Sound region. Take a look at Patty and Howard Stambor's Magnolia Garden. Not only does this garden boast a huge variety of aesthetic and edible plants, but they grow such an abundance of produce that they share with the neighbors. Hi guys, thanks for having us in your beautiful garden today. Can you tell us about some of the more special features of your sustainable garden? Well, there are a couple of things, and as you take the tour, you'll see, I think as you're going down the steps, one of the first things you're gonna see are some cobbled together mason bee nest, which we've had for a number of years to encourage pollinators. Now, I, I know it's been, uh, the die off of uh, the honeybees has happened, but we were doing this before just because it seemed like a good idea. You'll also see how we've decided to tr collect rainwater. We recently had to re-roof our house and we figured, you know, while we're doing this, let's just figure a way to channel all this water in a useful way. And we've got a system where we collect probably 90% of the water that falls on our roof. This is a worm bin. This is one of the things that we do to amend our soil, improve the soil, and make our plants strong and healthy. It's three trays. Top tray is where you add new stuff. Uh, there are probably very few worms in there by now. Bottom tray, which was, once looked like the top tray but got put on the bottom, is now pretty much done. And it has a uh, few worms still that are lingering behind, but mostly it's beautiful worm castings that you add to the soil. Uh, the worms, when they finish eating what's there, they crawl up through holes in the bottom to the next layer, which is the second. And you can see the second one is sort of halfway between the first and the third. And that's the worm bin. And this is uh, basically worm tea. It's the liquid that flows off that you capture in the bucket and we give, them, give the plants a dose of it every now and then. I think it helps them. This is our compost bin system uh, where we make compost that is the absolute best thing you can have for building your soil. And building soil is the key to any successful garden. Now, we've got the usual predictable stuff in it, flowers, leaves, grass clippings, but over the years we've discovered interesting ways to what I, I call it mining the urban waste stream, where we find useful good stuff right in the neighborhood that contributes to making really rich and really powerful compost. I've got coffee grounds from a neighborhood coffee shop. You can't see it, but there's a huge amount of tea leaves in there from a neighborhood tea room. Uh, this is spent grain from a local microbrewery, and this all goes into the blend. Uh, keep it moist, keep it covered, and in a few weeks you've got beautiful compost that you add to your garden. Your soil gets stronger, healthier, your plants resist insects, they resist disease. This is, this is really the magic stuff for doing a garden. We try to incorporate the neighborhood in our gardening by inviting people to come in and pick from our garden when we have an abundance of raspberries or cucumbers or something like that. But it kind of brings the neighborhood together when we do that. There's tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, uh, tons of greens, chard, kale, lettuces, uh, a large plant that's now gone to flower called a cardoon, which is related to the artichoke. And there's a cherry tree down there. Uh, huge variety of fruit, all in a, a small magnolia backyard. What do root rots, mildews, and wilts all have in common? 
They're all plant diseases that can harm your veggie crop. There is a simple, natural way, though, to help stymie these diseases and help give you a bumper crop. The answer? Crop rotation. To start with, plant your vegetable beds by types. It is helpful to have at least four different beds. Group your tomatoes and peppers in one location, the hottest place you can find. Your broccoli, cauliflower, and kale in one bed, and your squash and cucumbers in another. And peas and beans in a fourth. Of course, these plants are not all planted at the same time, just grouped together. The next year, plant your beds with different vegetables. Put your peas where your squash were, and your tomatoes where your peas were, and so on. It doesn't matter too much which order you rotate them in. Just make sure the same type of plant is not in the same bed for three or four years. What does this do? Many plant diseases target specific vegetables. They are less likely to persist in the soil if you take away their host. Since vegetables use different amount of nutrients out of the soil, rotating your plantings to new beds each year helps reduce the amount of nutrients you need to put back in. Well, I'm gonna go see if I can find something here to snack on while Doug gives you some great design ideas. At the Stambors, the entire garden is about quiet aesthetics, low maintenance, native and drought tolerant plants, and the biggest Northwest design trend, no lawn. Notice that the fence is a composting fence. And by working with all the different levels of their slope, they have created a variety of outdoor rooms. But don't let a small yard prevent you from having a beautiful and productive edible garden as well. Although most of us wouldn't call this a small yard, the Stambers still use some great space-saving techniques, especially in the backyard, where they concentrated their sustainable efforts. They've allowed for at least seven hours of sunlight a day. People often think they have full sun when they really don't. They've also grown shorter things to the south and taller things to the north, making full use of available light. The Stambors show us we can grow a lot of things at home. Even if you don't have a garden, you can grow food in containers. Let's head out to Mara Farm in Seattle and find out more. Mara Farms is a four and a half acre plot in Seattle's South Park neighborhood. Its fertile soil has been in cultivation since 1880. More than 1,000 volunteers for Lettuce Link work the land, harvesting more than 12,000 pounds of food a year. Most goes to the Providence Regina Food Bank. The farm is also a fine teaching center. We asked Sue McGann to give us a few tips on container gardening. Okay, very easy to grow your own food at home and very needy for people to do this right now with the cost of uh, food and everything. So lots of people don't have yards. Um, but you can certainly grow food easily in containers and you don't have to go out and buy special containers You can use a lot of what's in your yard in your house Even these things you can find nurseries will pass them on to you for free So anything you don't need anything really big to grow Especially the fall and spring crops which we'll talk about planting right now in the fall and the spring You pretty much have the same kinds of crops because it's the same kind of weather. It's cool cooler. So in the fall and the spring we can do your lettuces, your spinaches, all your kales and chards, even carrots and onions. Um, so you want to have the pot fit the plant that you're going to be growing. So for example, um, carrots, long and skinny, these carrots were planted maybe, I don't know, a month ago from seed. And um, you can see that they'll be able to make long skinny carrots in that container, old container with a broken. Here's an old olive oil can. Onions, you know, you can grow lots of onions in here. They have room to grow down here. They might come out square <laughs> because of the can. But anyway, so to get started on planting just a little sample of what we can do, you must use potting soil. And the reason is you can't, you can't use your regular soil out of the, um, you dig up out of the ground because it doesn't have enough aeration. Things that are planted in the ground have the whole microflora of what's going on in the ground there's all the microbiology going on there. You don't have that in a container, so you have to use you know, imitation soil in the container, which is what potting soil is. So potting soil is nice and fluffy. You would fill it up to you know, almost to the top. You wanna leave it a little bit lower so it can hold water, and you wanna um, 
leave room to put the roots of the plant. So here's some lettuces. Um, every single one of these lettuces can fit into here. If you can imagine what a head of lettuce, what size that will be, but they are easily can grow really close together. So if you buy some little plant starts, you would just pop it out on the bottom. The roots sometimes go circular around and around because they're in a pot, so loosen them up, make sure they won't keep doing that. Dig a nice little hole, tuck it in like you're tucking your kids into bed, nice and soft. Flip out another one. Actually, I think I'm going to put three in here just because of the size of the root ball. Three lettuces in here. The other thing about containers is they don't have all the nutrients that are in the soil. And so containers do need to be fertilized. You can get an all-purpose or a vegetable natural organic fertilizer. It does time release on their own. Nature's ingredients does it on its own. So this is um, a natural fertilizer, a lot of fish and crab and stuff in here. Put a little bit, maybe a teaspoon or a tablespoon around. Voila, and then we water it. So it's fun, easy to do to grow your own food in containers. Um, these are the kind of crops right here in front of me that you can grow in the spring and the, and the fall. So we have arugulas, kales, your lettuces, spinaches, chard, all the greens really like cool weather and they can be grown um, in the fall. So jump in and do it. It's easy, it's fun, and it's good for you. Sometimes it makes sense to let a professional farmer do the growing. The Snoqualmie Valley has a long agricultural history. Its soil is considered by many farmers as some of the best in the world. The valley is home to many local organic farms that sell their goods directly to consumers. Growing Things Farm in Carnation stands out because it offers fresh produce, meat, and eggs. There's a certification called Salmon Safe that means that we are basically um, not polluting the environment and we're actually taking steps to enhance the ecosystem around us. The salmon are a, uh, a key part of our ecosystem and they're really a telltale sign of how the health of this region is doing. We do habitat for insects. So you, if you look around me, there's quite a bit of weeds. That's not the norm for most farms because what you want to do in most farms is you want to clean the ground and you want to, you want all of your energy that you're putting in, all of your dollars that you're putting in to go into that head of lettuce or that broccoli or that kale or whatever. But what we see as important is having a habitat for the beetles having a habitat for the soldier bugs and the ladybugs, um, letting different weeds grow and propagating the weeds that we really want there to create an ecosystem everywhere that you look because everywhere that you look, there's life happening. Uh, we collect eggs three times a day, uh, at least to make sure that we are not cooking our eggs in there and we're not letting any eggs break. <laughs> You can stay in there. Hey guys. Oh, did I wake you up from your nap? So there's such a high demand for ethically raised, pastured, organic pork that all of our pigs are sold before they're even born. We sell whole pigs uh, directly to consumers and directly to chefs at restaurants. Everything that they eat is organic. The ground is organic that they're raised on, so no hormones, no antibiotics. We need to all produce for each other. Um, there are a lot of people out there that don't get the opportunity to work with nature. We try and be as productive as possible in a balance. If it's not feasible for you to grow a garden right in your own backyard, 
What are some other ways to get involved in local produce in the city? This is the Inner Bay Pea Patch where a lot of people raise their own vegetables close to home. If you look around your neighborhood, you can probably find a pea patch to get involved with or start your own. An even easier way to get involved is to plan a weekly visit to your local farmer's market. Here's Steve Evans of King County's Agriculture Program to talk about farmer's markets and a special program called Puget Sound Fresh. Thanks, Doug. You know, we're fortunate that the broad river valleys of the Puget Sound region hold some of the richest soils in our nation. Because of this, we grow some of the best produce available. We also have a great system of farmers markets. We have 88 in the Puget Sound region and 32 of those are in King County. There's over, at farmers markets, there are over 300 varieties of produce of different types of products available. Fruits, berries, uh, all kinds of vegetables, everything imaginable that's grown in this area. And you can get, you can get that fresh directly from the farmer and put it on your plate that evening. If you check out our Puget Sound Fresh website, you can find the one closest to you. Thanks, Steve. As you can see, there are many ways you can support our local food systems just by picking up some of those beautiful fruits and vegetables at the farmer's market or right at the farm. It's that easy. Let's take a look at all of the food we found today. We have fresh eggs from the Stamber's hens, some produce from Growing Things Farm, and bread and meat from the Bellevue Farmer's Market. I admit it was a little more work to pull the sandwich together, but it was worth every minute of it. Here's another tip. If you're trying to reduce the amount of pesticides you're eating, we have a handy shopper's card available through a link at our website. This handy wallet card explains which fruits and veggies have the fewest pesticide residues. Eating locally helps protect Puget Sound agricultural land and supports our local farmers. And somehow it just tastes better, like home. Now all we need are a couple of those great Pacific Northwest microbrews, and we're good to go. Oh well. Cheers. If you'd like to find a farmer's market or an organic farm near you, visit our website. Until next time, have a healthy garden. And a healthy family too. Yeah,